Hello everyone, welcome back. Something uh, funny, I was looking back on some of the videos and it's hilarious that both Rosie and I start everything with, hello everyone. So uh, I don't know, maybe I'll we'll start, you know, mixing it up a bit, you know, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, today we're very excited to have someone who's going to join us for the next 60 minutes, Mr. Adam Lenton. Um, if you haven't heard of Adam Lenton, then shame on you, first of all. Uh, but secondly, um, he's a, a, a dramaturg, a director, and a musical theatre specialist who specialises in um, new work. I'm not going to go into his wonderful um, uh, backlog of musicals that he's been involved with, because hopefully he will talk to you about that. So hopefully he's there. Let's just have a look. Is he there? Yes. Adam, oh, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, thank you so much for, for joining us today. So um, just a little uh, a bit about what today is going to be about um, is we're going to talk to, to Adam about his directing and producing career and, and he works ex very extensively in, in new works, which is wonderful. We need those people in our industry championing that area. Um, but also Adam will be back with us tomorrow with an hour, another hour session. So we'll talk about uh, what that's going to be about today. So how is lockdown britain for you at the moment adam how, how are you coping yeah okay i um okay I, I was saying to james in the waiting room that i've been i've always kind of been having to make my own work happen um i've always been a little bit of an entrepreneur and a little bit um <laughs> of a hustler i suppose so I, i'm used to trying to make products with which there is no infrastructure currently and so lockdown feels a little bit like more of that for me. It's just trying to negotiate and figure out how to support the artists I care about and how to try and generate more work for this moment and so that we're ready when lockdown eases. So, yeah, I mean, the good thing is you can develop work in lockdown um, and it's a great time for writers, those who feel able to write. And I suppose the other thing is I'm a nerd and I, I'm, I love <laughs> technology and so I've been... I've been running concerts almost every week in lockdown, um, new musical theatre live concerts, uh, which I've just really enjoyed the sort of technical, the technical element of trying to make something of this moment that we haven't seen before. And um, so, so I'm enjoying that. And, and it's been great because I used to run these concerts called Signal in the Real World. I've now been doing them on live and we've been able to bring in artists live from Australia, from Canada, from from america so impossible lineups who i could never possibly have in a gig ever unless they were online so i'm enjoying that how wonderful now what seems to have started with that is there a place that people can go to what yes place? yeah absolutely so we've done six of those concerts and another three artist concerts you can find them at alpmusicals.com forward slash concerts um yeah so it's it's um yeah, there's there's many, many hours now at this point of incredible concerts. Duncan Cheek, Toby and Lucy, who wrote Six. Um, just had uh, Ben Kaplan, incredible Canadian singer-songwriter Ben Kaplan, Eve Blake from Australia. So just like art, amazing artists, that some of which you might have heard of, some of you might never have heard of making new musicals. It's really been a, a treat in that way. Yeah. We've found that during this period, even though obviously there have been times of uh, immense stress, um, there has been a time where, you know, we've we've saved a lot of time because we're not travelling. We're not doing, we're not like flat out with like all, all the normal things of life, which is, is kind of been a, sort of a little bit liberating. And with that has come like a, a kind of, that you've just uh, spoken about, this international connection where we're, we, we've always worked internationally anyway, so we get a lot of reaching out from from different uh, places around the globe but but certainly with through this um initiative that we put together we're getting more of that which i think is and rosie think really exciting do you have you felt that like you say you couldn't have these people in your room so there's a it's not that it, there's there's this newness to to how we, we're possibly going to be creating uh, coming up in the future yeah i think there's there's two things that i've noticed i mean on a good day it really does feel utopian hmm. it does feel like you know a lot of the sort of hierarchies and red tape and kind of inability to get yourself heard and seen and to create new work that do exist normally um it does feel like those on a good day it does feel like those things don't exist and again i know it's a t sad and terrible time but i think one of the things that's interesting is 
my YouTube channel is accessible and the seats are as comfortable as the National Theatre's YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> so th there, there is a feeling of access and, and possibility. Obviously, there's also content overload, uh, which means people don't always know where to look and where to get the best quality. But I think that that will start changing and, and there will be more curation and more quality control. Um, but for me, it's also the, the friendships I'm making are real. Um, you know, I'm writing to artists who I always admired, you know, across the Atlantic and said, I do this concert now. Would do you want to do a song? It has to be live. Like I'm pretty specific <laughs> about the liveness. I think pre-recorded videos are fine, but I think that there's something special, the risk and the kind of the attention of, of, of liveness. So I've been saying, you know, do you want, do you want to do a live concert? And then I meet them on Zoom and I set up their sound and I get to know them a bit. And then we chat afterwards and I, I've made real real friends during this time and real connections across the musical theatre landscape. And I, my sense is musical theatre has never felt more global than it does at this moment. Um, and again, that's that's for sad reasons, because never has there been a situation that has affected everyone this globally before. But I think I think if we can take the positive thing from that, we should, which is that everyone's accessible. Everyone's at home. Everyone is almost Obviously, everyone is trying to to earn money and trying to to survive, but at the same time, also everyone is is reminded of the reasons that they are artists and, and what they wanted to make. So, yeah, definitely. As we're going through this, uh, you subscribers out there, you know what to do. You can write into the live comments uh, any questions that you may have, and we'll do that. So, do that as we go. If you have anything that you want to to highlight, bring up, even if you've seen one of Adam's awesome productions and just want to say it was awesome, uh, please do that. It's always nice to have that connection. And actually the connection you're talking about, Adam, you know, connecting, we're, we're connecting with people that we hadn't before either. Uh, and it, and it, is, it is really special. So let's talk about you. Why, 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 Adam? Yeah, why why theatre? Why new work? Um, what's your background? What, how did you come into uh, th the theatre world? What was your entrance? Sure. So I I always loved, actually as a teenager, I, I, I really loved film and video games. Um, I was really into the kind of the structure of the way they told stories and the kind of the type of stories that they told. And that was probably when I was sort of 14 or 15. And I was really... I'd been to probably, you know, I'm from London, so I'd been lucky enough to go to like one West End musical a year with my family of the type you could expect, which, you know, I loved at the time. Miss Saigon, Les Mis, Sunset Boulevard. Um, and, but, you know, my, my passion were, I thought, these, these films and these video games. And then when I was 15, I saw my brother, my brother did a uni production of Company by Stephen Sondheim. And I thought, what is this? <laughs> and then later that same year, I went to the Edinburgh Festival for the first time. I think I was 16 then. And I saw a production, a student production um, of Merrily We Roll Along. And at the time, I'd been really obsessed with this movie, Memento, which goes backwards. Um, oh, yeah. Brilliant. And so when I heard that there was this musical that went backwards and it was by the person who wrote Company. So I saw Merrily We Roll Along and I, I suddenly was like, oh, musicals are my thing if they're like this. Mm -hmm. um when musicals are this mature and intelligent and structurally audacious and and emotive because emotion is something i'm really interested in. so i was really hooked on musicals from then but um i was going to university i was good at science and i like people so i went to university to study medicine i was meant to be a doctor um and i as i said i really like science and i really like people and i thought that meant i should be a doctor because i went to a pushy school and that you know i'm jewish and i have parents who you know want security and for me i think that's kind of a traditional jewish trait actually is that it's just you know parents just want the best for their kids and they want them to be financially stable um and so i i went to be a, med a doctor but i was very unhappy it just felt like cramming facts into my brain and i i really felt like i had something artistic to say and then yeah i um I, I graduated after the first half of my degree, three years, and was like, do you know what? I had done musicals through university and I thought I want to, I, I want to give this a go. But already by that point at uni, I had done a 
the Sondheim musical and I had done a Michael John Lacusa musical. So my taste was always, and I would still say this exists today, my taste is musicals that are not for families, um, musicals for adults. Um, I, I like kids fine, but I've no interest in making work for them and I don't think I should have to. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I realized in England, if I wanted to make musicals for adults, almost exclusively they were being made by subsidized theaters and subsidized theaters seemed to dislike people who liked musicals or be suspicious of them. Um, so for about five or six years, I assistant directed and I, I made very careful decisions to look like I also liked plays and was not an idiot. So, I don't know if I can, you know, because I really think there is a, there is, it's so true. there's a divide, there's a taste divide when it comes to musicals and so often if a, if a subsidized theater that never does musicals does a musical, they'll hire a director who's never done one before, just so it doesn't look or feel I'm... like that. Um, so I, you know, so I assisted at the RSC, I assisted at the Old Vic and the Hampstead Theatre, and I, I, I mixed up plays and musicals and revivals because I was trying to figure out my taste and what I liked. Um, I particularly realized I love time and memory um, and sort of multi-generational things, which music is so effective for. Anyway, I was assisting, for about eight years directing every so often and people kept saying oh well when it's your time you'll just stop assisting and you'll direct and it just never really happened um that is a lie i think that you just suddenly you just decide to stop assisting yeah. and, and all this directing work comes i think um and so i i made this decision i was about the end of my 20s i had directed by that point you know in theaters like the Fimbra or um German Street, you know, small, lovely theatres, but I wasn't really getting any traction. And I thought, what have I always cared about? I've always cared about musicals. I'm going to stop trying to be what I think the industry wants me to be. And I'm just going to say, I'm going to be the person who cares about new musicals. I'm going to be the person who cares about mature musicals, musicals that disrupt form and tone and sound and look different. And I guess if I talk about it enough with enough passion and with enough care that maybe people will start listening. And, and I, I got this sense that the musical of the sort I cared about was growing in popularity. The original artist driven musical, I call it, you know, something Hamilton is artist driven. Dear Evan Hansen is artist driven. They're not producer driven. And I just remember think, you know, those writers were championing those stories. And I remember thinking something's changing. It's about 2015 in the way that musicals in America are happening. And, and I, I just thought now or never, right? I was, as I said, I was about to be 30 and I thought either I'm going to quit or I'm going to, or I'm going to stick at this. And what's the point of sticking at it unless you care about what you're doing? So um, for me, it had always been music and music theatre and musicals, stories and musicals. And I just thought I'm going to double down and I sort of doubled down and then redoubled and redoubled. And that's where I am now. <laughs> Brilliant yeah. stuff. So, like, what with regards to some of, some of the stuff that you've worked on, um, tell us about that. What was the first? What was your first production? Oh yeah. How did that go? Uh, and you know, was it as easy as you thought, or did you know that it wasn't going to be easy? And then, how? Tell us a little bit about uh, how you've sort of progressed through to now. Yeah, great. So, my first production as a director was, I think it was two thousand and eight which ages me, um, and it was Ordinary Days by Adam Guan. Um, so initially, most of my, um, most of, I was really interested in new musicals, as I said, but I didn't really know much about the writing community here. And also the idea of developing a new musical from scratch is an overwhelming and to this day, very difficult thing. So what I used to do is look out for shows and writers in America whose work had already been produced. So it was new, but it was like it had existed <laughs> in a folder and it had reviews maybe. And that's how I ended up at university directing See What I Want to See by Michael John Lacusa. Um, and then, yeah, when it came to, I was on MySpace Googling writers, MySpace, you know, RIP, and I, um, I found a composer called Adam Guan's MySpace page and there were four songs in there and one of them was I'll Be Here, which is one of the best standards of all time. Audrey McDonald's sung it now. I mean, many people have sung it. And I just, and it was him singing it at the time and I wrote to him and I said, could I get the full script? And he posted it to me because there was no Dropbox then. Mm -hmm. um, and and then I got a slot, a Sunday, Monday slot at the Finborough. Um, 
and I did it. And it was, I, I love doing things that I haven't seen. Personally, I much prefer doing shows I've never seen before for, 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 for two reasons. One, because I am um, of ego and one because of nervousness. In terms of, in terms of ego, it's really nice to do something no one's done before. Yeah. Um, in terms of nervousness, it's really great to do something that you've never seen and you don't have like a big, chunky version standing over your shoulder. Like, I don't want to do Follies at the Fimbra. I've seen, right. it, I've, right. I've seen it on Broadway. Like, I don't, want to, I don't want to do it on five pounds. So I think that feeling of knowing that I wanted to do shows that felt special um, led to that. So yeah, Ordinary Days went pretty well at the Fimbra. I, I would say... And, and I, I say this to, to to people who are starting out as directors. I don't think my brain has got any better at... Um, I know what I think my production should feel like and how they should function and how they should flow. And I feel like I knew then what I know now, but man, have I got better at communicating than I had then. <laughs> Do you know, I think as teenagers, we look at film, we look at music, we look at art, and we know how we want the things we make to sound and feel, but we're just not very adept at doing it, at communicating, yeah. at rehearsing yeah. so that no one's stressed. So that like, what knowing what to ask for, knowing how to work with a designer and a tech team. So I was really proud of the show we got, but it felt the process did feel stilted. It was like, I don't know how to ask for this. Am I asking right? I don't know how to right. like do this thing that's in my head. Not that I prepare too much, but actually I will say one thing I truly remember from Ordinary Days, which is there was some staging we had done in the auditions where we'd done some recalls and we'd brought in pairs and I found some staging moments with those people in auditions and I thought, oh, that was really cool. And then I brought it into the rehearsal room and with the two actors who ended up doing it, who weren't the two that went in the audition when I figured that thing out. And I tried asking them to do that thing that I had done elsewhere. And it just didn't work. It was like something I'd pre-prepared and it was trying to like, it was like clothing that didn't quite fit them. And that's when I realized, I think a large part of directing is knowing how something feels, but like working in the room and being brave enough to do it in front of a room of people and to like process and guide and kind of parse what you're doing with those people, not to just do it all at home and then come in and tell people where to stand like a school teacher. But I will say that is nerve wracking. And I've, you know, when you get to bigger shows and I've like had cast of eight or 12 or 20 and you know, they're looking at you going, what next? Yeah. And you want to like tell them, you want to keep them keep them happy and you want to make sure that they feel empowered and you also want to make them know that they're in an organized environment and i feel so much of directing is having the skills to actualize what is in your head um i think and i think that's why a lot of, when i was younger i was like i know i can do this but then it actually came to it and i was like wow i've got a lot to learn about how to do it without you know how to how to make an omelet without um, uh, making as much mess without you have to break the eggs but you just don't want to make a get mess everywhere that's a terrible metaphor sorry <laughs> i love it <laughs> so, so i mean when you produce as well right so what what like when was did you do you produce and direct at the same time i mean have you done that a lot or have you moved on from have you matured knowing that that is madness to to to, to produce and direct at the same time what, what how's that work for you I mean, I would say everyone who's ever started out as a director has, whether they've named themselves a producer or not, have done a lot of the pieces of what producing involve just to get something on. The way I describe a lot of what I do is there aren't yet shops for the work that I want to make. So I feel like loads of my, you know, what when nowadays on the internet, if you've got a product and you want to sell it and John Lewis won't stock it, you can sell it yeah. on Etsy, you can sell it on yeah. eBay. I'm yeah. like Etsy and eBay for musicals. I'm like trying to figure out like, a marketplace where I can get direct to consumer. So of course I was always doing hus hustling and, and bits of the job, but no, I never would have called myself a producer. Um, to be honest, I felt really weird calling myself a director for about five years. If anyone asked, I would just be like, um, I'm a assistant directing and I am wanting to direct and I met theater. I don't know. I think earning your label is, is sometimes a self-imposed thing, but I, um, when it came to produce basically about three, four years ago, I just realized 
I realized I kept having to knock on doors to ask producers for their approval for the mm. stuff that I cared about and believed in. And I, 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 I kept noticing the people who really seemed to like me were writers. Writers seemed to like me because I really love writers and I love writing. I love music. I love songs. But I kept feeling like I was seeing this thing that, that I kept having to try and convince other people in the industry that existed. And I've just found it tiring. I spent half of my time trying to convince people that I, what I was seeing wasn't a lie. And, <laughs> you know, some days that makes you feel like you're seeing ahead of the curve and sometimes it makes you feel like you're insane. I'm probably a bit of both. Um, but I was really keen to, I just was like, I'm spending so much time asking permission and not enough time actually focusing on the work. And if, if I spent half as much time as I am asking other people for permission, just trying to infuse people with money, with my passion for writing, and getting stuff to happen, then it would probably make me less sad. Because it's really knocking on doors, you know, for anyone watching, actors, producers, directors, everyone, we spend a lot of our time knocking on doors to people oh. who don't care. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and why, wish, why would I just went, why would I put my time in people who aren't being caring in, in return for the thing? I'm just, I am just a nerdy kid who cries when he listens to songs from musicals. Um, <laughs> however i might seem on the internet however i might i just i that's that's where i was at 18 and that's why i that's why i'm doing this so i just wanted to be in an environment where i could be passionate and care and 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 not bogged down by logistics and it turned out the best way of, to me to do that was the metaphor i use is to build my own bonfire um and i don't love producing i much prefer being in a rehearsal room but i've realized that as a producer i could maybe i could touch a hundred shows in a year or, you know, 50 writers in a year. As a director, you can probably only do four. And I really aspire mm. to widespread systemic and structural change within the way new musical theater is embedded in our country. And um, I think that that's going to include volume. I, I think that once we've got 10, 20, 40 new musicals, once we've got those sorts of levels of writers, we can't just have one every 20 years. Yeah, I love Toby and Lucy, but like, they can't be the only ones. It can't just be like <laughs> Andrew Lee Webber, then Styles and Drew, then Toby and Lucy. Like yeah. in America right now, we have, you know, we have Dave Malloy, we have Michael R. Jackson, we have Max Vernon, we have, um, you know, uh, I'm now just trying to do that thing where I list people, Janine Tesori and Lin-Manuel Miranda and Pasek and Paul and, and 30 50 amazing writers who are being what are they what yeah. are they doing over there that we're not doing over here do you think is it is it as simple as because rosie and i talk about this all the time and talk about that place that one day we will run where the, it will be a hub of currently we, we appear to be creating that online and that's you know for this this right. type of things but we're always thinking about like you know that building that exists where what you're talking about is a weekly thing and to energize the industry both musical theater and new playwriting uh and for people to make horrible mistakes but that's okay the audience still come so in essence what the old uh edinburgh fringe festival used to be like where everything was a fiver and so within a day you'd you'd see you'd go right i'm gonna i can see five shows today and you'd spend that and that's what your budget was each day and because you could just pop in and some of it was amazing and some of it was utter garbage but it didn't matter it wasn't now like nearly 20 pound a ticket i can see one thing and so i better make sure it's the thing that's reviewed the best which is yeah. completely against what it's supposed to be about so is it that the, the is it is it lack of venue? Is it lack? Of, and I I know what you're saying about like there are other producing houses that will do that show great when it's you know, but they are he heavily sub subsidised and they are able to do that fantastic. But is it is the, is it the venue? Do we need that venue? Is it the investment? Is it producers? Is it writers? What are we? What don't we have that America do have? I mean, it's, that's a big question. And um, <laughs> I will I will preface this by saying I have spent lockdown writing a book of my thoughts about musical theatre. So I'm up to about 40,000 words now. And I cover a lot of this in there. So I probably can't cover it all. Ticket prices is a huge thing. Yeah. Um, accessibility is a huge thing. Um, yeah, you know, there was a study that when Hamilton, as great as it is, that when Hamilton opened, 
he didn't lift all boats. It lifted Hamilton. You know, people people saved up the money it would cost to see eight other shows on Broadway to wait yeah. to see that one show. Yeah. Um, I think, but um, what I always say, and maybe it's a bit utopian, and maybe people look at it and say that it's a little a little naive. But what I always say is, as an industry, we need to make people care about people who write musicals. We need to stop making people care about you know i love leading actors and i i i appreciate that there are people who become stars through musical theater for performing as alpha or performing in waitress and, and th those are incredible things that they then get fan bases but it's surreal to me that we don't direct fandom towards the people that write these shows um we don't direct fandom towards, we don't direct popularity towards the people. We don't shine lights on the people that write the shows. We brand the show. We, we erase the writer um, on posters. We, we make it a logo and then we put the person who's starring in it. And I think there's this problem in musical theater where we don't actually care about the people who are writing them. So it comes to the point where we'd much rather have, we'd much rather have Robbie Williams writing a musical from an audience and a commercial perspective, which makes I cannot tell you how little sense it makes from a creative perspective um, that someone would spend a self-confessed two weeks writing a musical and every song in it is flat, which in Girl and Dress is flat, which means it doesn't progress the plot. It's it's a sort of a pop song. There's sort of no interrogation. I'll happily moan about this and I would do it publicly anywhere because um, I'm not afraid. I, I think if people don't speak out, the industry is going to mush itself into a kind of celebrity haze. If we care about the writers who care about the form, our musicals will be better and everything will change. The issue is theatres using, I've got, you know, a chapter in my book is called Cash Machines. Theatres use their musicals as cash machines rather than as shows. Uh, another chapter in my book is um, the idea that we we hire people who intrinsically don't like collaborating. So we, we hire high level playwrights and high level singer songwriters and try and make them collaborate when they never have in, you know, 20 plus year careers. So yeah, I tell you what, there are people out there who've spent their entire lives wishing that they could write a musical um, and have spent every single moment digesting and absorbing all of the musical influences that they need and all of the craft influences they need. And we're mostly ignoring those people most of the time. Um, yeah, <laughs> so uh, it's simple. Um, set up literary departments in theatres that care about artists who write musicals. Stop making presumptions about what the form is and what it can be. Stop saying all musicals are this, all musicals sound like this. It's not going to be a quick project. It's going to take 5, 10, 20 years. But when's the best time to plant a tree? To go, when's the second time, best time to plant a tree today? So I just think it's never too late to make people care about artists who care. And um, I'm just going to keep doing that. And, and either I'll be, you know, a raving old man who just went. But I don't think so, because... I genuinely um, believe I genuinely believe that the writers I'm championing are are the next Lemon Miranda's of, and the next Janine Tesori's and um, yeah yeah got passionate absolutely there. I mean I think I think it's that isn't it it's it's uh, when I gra I graduated uh, drama school doing a musical theatre uh, diploma um, twenty four years ago and um, I went there with innocence um, thinking oh if I go if I go there I'll learn three disciplines i'll learn to dance and sing and act and uh, not realizing that when i left um what the industry would then how they would box me and label me and so on and so forth and certainly through our casting and the way we approach casting that is doesn't exist um, because we won't let it because we experienced it for our entire careers um you know and i did plays and i directed plays I, you know I, i'm an actor but i sing and i can move a bit certainly don't dance um but but i love to dance i love it it's 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 a wonderful uh, expression feeling um and i i think it's about uh, accepting that every we talk about this all the time with colleges and q and a's i did one uh, yesterday it's about saying that no no work is rubbish if you wake up every day and you're happy doing it if you wake up whatever you're doing as an artist and you go oh I'm just, I, that's success. Success is right there. And I think that it's taking all those walls down um, throughout our industry to continue to take those walls down and to say, listen, it, it, don't put that person down. You're only doing that because you probably can't do it. That's the thing, you know, or you're, and that's a lot, which moves on to like diversity in, in, 
in our industry and and, and how that folds and, and continuing to break those balls down. And uh, Rosie and I are constantly not just learning, but but seeking to learn about um, about how our industry will look in five years. And we're doing it through this platform. We've got people coming in talking specifically about mental health, Black Lives Matter. We've got um, uh, an Indian actor coming in, Sheila, on Friday, who, who was in one of our seminars talking about what it's like to be an Indian actor and how she connects with the industry and, and teaching us, and we're learning all together um, about how to get the best performers for whatever we're, we're wanting. So, and I know that you've championed diversity as well. So what's your angle? As it may be on on how when how you reach out and and what is what does diversity look like to you? What does it mean to you? You know, how, where do you come from with that? I mean, uh, just to, yeah, I'll get to that and just but just a couple of things in your in your response, which I just want to pull out and I agree with. I mean, the first is why is it that when people can do more things? we take them less seriously. No, uh, I just, no. I really feel like the amount of people I've said that, who have said, oh, you know, musicals, are, musicals are simplistic. Musicals aren't as meaningful as plays. Acting in a musical isn't as difficult as acting in a play. It's a great deal harder. I mean, it, it, it's easy to do a bad performance in anything. It's definitely easy to do a bad performance in a musical, but- um, And there's terrible writing. There's terrible TV, terrible oh film, my goodness. terrible yeah, plays. It's, it's yeah. terrible everything, isn't there? But there's great everything as well. Yeah, to me, making a musical, being in a musical is a three-dimensional thing, requires so many interwoven, stacked and layered skills to, to be in one, to write one, to make one. Everyone needs to be constantly juggling those skills. To me, it's the difference between a jigsaw puzzle and a Rubik's Cube. It's 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 uh, something flat and something three-dimensional. So uh, the scorn that's poured upon musicals, like anyone can do it. I tell you what, those people who are amazing at plays and say, I'll do a musical, often their musicals are bad. Um, <laughs> And, and interestingly, w watching people who mishandle a musical and then blame the form rather than own up to the fact that they did a bad job of something that is incredibly precise and layered and skillful and difficult uh, always, always hurts me too because people kind of barge in, they mess everything up and then they say, oh, well, it was broken when I got here. Um, it wasn't broken when you got here. You just, you just went up to it. Uh, so that's the thing. The thing I think that links almost my entire everything, casting and musical theatre and is is we need to stop making assumptions we, we make these assumptions and these presumptions all this or this all musicals are upbeat all musicals cost more all musicals are bigger than plays and, and i think it's the same way as when it comes to casting that we go oh all alphabets all alphabets must have a voice that sounds like this all um all sophie's and mamma mia must look like that <laughs> Everyone must do the same staging in every part of every musical, like a kind of bad sort of game of telephone that just repeats and repeats these kind of same stagings. Um, I just think for me, it's always about asking about those assumptions and going, why? Because as soon as you start to crack those assumptions, you start to you start to just have new options and like new possibilities for what you're making in all regards. As soon as you go, oh, do, do I have to cast it that way? And as soon as you, you take away your, what is essentially an assumption or a presumption that you're making that's rarely ever there. And what I will say about musical theatre with regards to casting is it is an intrinsically expressive art form. It is an expressionistic art form. It is non-naturalistic. People do not sing in real life. Um, well, they do sing, but they don't sing non-diegetically in real life um as they do in almost all musicals and so um so the idea that we have to have some sort of naturalism or casting verisimilitude i find infuriating i suppose the flip of that is one of the reasons i maybe you know raised my voice last year was 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 talking about jewish representation in in falsettos um I think we need to know when, if we're asking, if we're, if we're constantly challenging our assumptions and we're going, do I need to do that? Or should I do it this way? Or should I do it that way? If we're constantly questioning everything that we're doing as we're doing it, not in a way that's going to make us nervous and shaky, but if we just have these 
check-ins with ourselves. I'm going to check in on that. I'm going to think on that. Um, I think it will lead us to think, should I do an entire show where most of the cast are Jewish, there is Hebrew spoken and sung, there is like a bar mitzvah in it. Should I do that without any Jews anywhere? No. Equally, do, are there are there situations where it would be fascinating to recast and reframe a story? Yes. Um, and where the boundaries of that are, are complicated, but I just think we just need to keep talking and thinking and asking and not making assumptions because what I would say about Celador when it came to Falsetto Gate is they made an assumption it didn't matter. They probably never thought about it. They just had made an implicit and intrinsic assumption that it didn't matter to anybody. Um, and they never asked the question. So what I would just say is I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I fuck up, excuse my language, sorry, I make mistakes, but I, I, I always... I'm trying to ask questions and be curious and inquisitive and, and, and disrupt my normal thinking as often as I can. I don't, you know, it's not always perfect, but I just ask others, try and do the same right now. And if it's a bit messy and it's a bit ugly for now, well, it should be because any sort of, any sort of systemic change um, requires effort and work and, and thought. Anyway, I don't know if I answered that, but yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, and so like, with with that, um, where where do, do you? Even though we all have seek for diversity, are there boundaries within diversity, or should there just not be any boundaries? In when we come to cast a, a production, I think I think the answer I would normally give. I mean, it's a it's a it's a really tough question, but the. The thing I would say is everyone deserves the chance to see themselves and their stories on stage. Everyone. Um, from any background or any race, from any ethnicity, they deserve an opportunity to see themselves. So, you know, I, I know the stories of what it means to be a young black girl and see Matilda being played by a young black actor. What that means is is life changing. Um, in the same way that it is life changing for a young Jewish boy to see an accurate representation of his faith on stage, where you know pronunciation is correct and you know the, the meaning of that is correct. And I know that sounds like a floppy answer, but essentially, we need to create a system where, within a year within a season, within a theatre's output, within everything that, that we're trying wherever possible to make sure that everyone sees themselves represented on stage and everyone sees their stories um, uh, represented on stage. So if we're looking even at the stories that are being... So yeah, I think it's a, it's a two-layered question, probably even more, but it's... With falsettos, it was about making sure that Jewish stories were... You know, the, actually, Jews write a lot of musicals, but they don't actually... There aren't actually many musicals that can... Uh, are about Jewish characters. There's Fiddler on the Roof, there's Rags, and there's and there's falsettos. So for me, it was important in that rare moment to make sure that that was done properly. Um, equally, I, I, I really think that wherever possible, we should, we should be making sure that uh, our communities and our population is represented on stage and in the stories that we tell. It's as simple as that. If we, if we you know, there was a thing recently about the Almeida that, um, looked at the makeup of the community in which um, the Almeida sits and then, you know, contrasting that with the programming that they offer there and just going, all you have to do is look at the people who right. where you are, look at where you are right. and, and try and serve that and be in dialogue with that. And we're always going to make mistakes, but that's my opinion. How do we, how do we encourage diversity in writing? Because, you know, in, in my current experience is that that is low as well it, that there's that and it, i guess that comes from education which then comes from as, as a, I, I will make kind of broad assumptions but let's just to start the dialogue you know generally it's educated people that are from middle class families that have the education to learn about music to learn about writing that's but that's not to say that there aren't wonderfully talented, skilled musicians and writers 
that exist in in I hate using class, but working class families um, yeah. or lower socioeconomic groups, they just don't have that accessibility. And that's something else that Rosie and I talk about all the time, is that you know we actually need genuine and that's also what this platform part of this platform is about is to that this is free for people of all ethnicities of all you know associate economical groupings everywhere in the world can access this information and that is part of why we we did it as much as all of the other things uh because we have to somehow build platforms somehow build truthful um ways that that people can access a keyboard to write their thoughts down or, no i know it is. So how do we do that i know and you know a, an example of example of i mean there are the, a few different thoughts kind of bubbling around one of the interesting things is um it's harder to find a fee I just this is a bit of a tangent but it will loop back it's harder to find a a female guitarist today than it is to find a male guitarist and one of the reasons for that is that 20 years ago when instruments were being picked up there was a gendered sense of what instruments male identifying and female identifying yeah. children pick up um it's so, even that i'm a, i play woodwind and even yeah. that men, men played sax women with clarinet well, I, played the, I played the flute, even though I'm I'm well aware that that was, you know, at the time I was bullied for that. That's like a gender right. was a gendered instrument at the time. So we're looking at something that started 20 years ago. That, uh. um, and now, actually, because of the fact that music lessons are changing and because the way people are picking up instruments is changing, there are going to be more female guitarists and more female drummers in 20 years time. Um, which which so I think we have to start in the knowledge that it might not be quick, but when it comes to the, um, I do think, you know, when you look at someone like Lionel Bart, he was a working class writer. He, he could hum his tunes and he could write lyrics and he needed a, a music supervisor who could help him and who could help. And, you know, someone who could transcribe his songs to turn them into sheet music. And so for example, you know, Lin Manuel Miranda, incredible, mentioned him a lot of times. He's sort of his work is very synced up with like Alex Lacamoire, his music supervisor, who's much better at the piano than Lin is. Um, and so I, I do think we can create systems where, again, if we create systems where we stop leaving composers on their own, we'll create more opportunities for diversity of voice. Because I know that there are people who feel intimidated by the fact that they cannot write down sheet music. Um, or they yeah. cannot they cannot notate or they maybe cannot arrange but they can use samples or they can you know Eve Blake who I mentioned earlier who's Australian she, she created her entire show without being able to play an instrument or read music using samples and her laptop and it won all of the awards in Australia um, so and she just decided she wanted to write a show and yeah she used Ableton and, and, and MIDI to do that and but you have to you have to know that you can do that and you have to create spaces where people are given that power and support when they need it. Because tell you what, if, if you can hum a great tune and come up with an amazing idea, there is someone who can help actualize that, a music supervisor. Or can, and if we create systems where we stop putting the burden on everyone to do it all themselves, because if you're doing it all yourself, yeah, then you have to pay for it yourself. And if you haven't got your own home studio and your own and you're not intrinsically nerdy and it definitely biases the people who have a good computer and lots of tech experience and can create their own demos and have a good microphone and do all of that kind of stuff. What if you're a person who doesn't afford can't afford that kit but has all of the best ideas? We need to find ways of unlocking that and and leveling the playing field there. And the way we'll do that is if theaters actually cared about artists. And sorry to come back to that again, but most theatres don't really care about truly engaging with artists who write musicals. Mostly they're developing one musical and they're spending 10 years on it. And mostly it's a famous writer or a famous musician. And I would love it if anyone's watching from an institution who, who disagrees with me and has like a bubbling new... There are theatres, you know, the Lowry... There's a live new... comment box, please feel free you to know, write. But like if anyone's watching, you know, now or after, who takes an issue with that and really feel that they've got an in-house literary department that is engaging with meeting listening to reading scripts and trying to de you know de-hierarchy this space 
any more than I'm doing on my own, I'm really interested to meet you because I, I don't think that exists um, and it should. I really wish, I really hope I become obsolete as a producer and can just go back to directing work. But I realized five years ago that I was never going to be able to direct the things I cared about without leaving this country. And I thought about leaving and going to New York and I was halfway down the visa chat with a lawyer. I just thought, I don't want to go to someone else's party. I'd rather there be a party here. And I don't mean to sound sad because I'm not sad. I know 50 writers who, you know, create songs that will blow your socks off. And it's all there to find on the internet. And they're all there, then you can email them. You don't just need to keep listening to Les Mis over and over. Les Mis is great, but I've, I've done my time. I've, I've worn out those tapes when I was a kid. I'm ready for more. So. There's actually Sheila, I wonder, uh, let us know if this is Sheila who's going to be with us on Friday, actually just asking the question that I had just built up, which is, oh, I mean, J James and Adam, great discussion so far. How do you think confidence can be built up for BAME writers to come forward uh, with their ideas for musicals and i think it, it is that isn't it it's having that that avenue um how do people contact you how how do people bring uh yes it's me hey hi sheila um how do people like what do you have a a source to write you're a new writer this is how i like to be contacted is there any way that you that you have that is that something that you do no so you like I've never, I'm, I'm mostly just me um yep. and I, I have, you know, friends and colleagues who, who help support what I'm up to, but it is just me. Um, I have my own particular taste, which you can probably track. I mean, it's it's not easy to track because I do a lot of different types of things. But as I said, I'm particularly interested in shows that are mature, not for children, um, sound and, and look and are about thematically things that, that are different for musicals. I, I'm more interested in the aesthetic you might find at the Barbican or, you know, in Germany or in Belgium than, than I am in the musicals that we find in the West End aesthetically. So I'm going to bias towards the stuff I pick up. I've never opened submissions um, because I do not have time to read everything. I don't. Like, I'm just me. And frankly, I, it takes me about half a day to read and reflect on a script. So... Um, I can't do that for everything. And also, a lot of people don't do enough research, I think, in terms of what I actually am interested in, because people still send me family musicals and, you know, song cycles, <laughs> song cycles about things that I clearly wouldn't be interested in. I, I'm public enough about what I care about. So um, the reason I've never opened submissions is just because I don't have the time to be able to respond to everybody and I don't want to say I can. But I have a contact form on my website. I'm regularly on social media and I'm very, very easy to find. Um, in terms of answering Sheila's question, I can, you know, signal an, an ALP, my production company, can probably do, uh, can always do better with regards to diversity and, and platforming non-white writers. But I am pretty proud of our record, I think, in terms of, you know, for a, it's just me, I have no public funding, I have no anything else, it's all held together with cardboard and and sellotape and blue tack and that you know i'm really proud of the diversity that we've had in our concerts and our productions and um you know we did a concert last night and a third of the writers were, uh, of, of of writing teams were were not white um so the i'm always working with that and i, I think the way that we build trust is that we show you other artists who are not white and show you other writers who aren't so that you you hopefully watch my concerts and go oh well there's space for me in concerts like that and 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 this is disrupting what i think of as the normal kind of shiny west end musical which looks and feels a certain way and and maybe i would approach that person equally i do think i think james i do think you have to work a bit harder so i do try my best to reach out to people who i see on social media directly and say um i would be interested to hear what you're up to because i think we we do need to rebalance <clears throat> things it's very very easy to program musical theater nights of entirely white writers and we should not be doing that um and yeah sheila send, send me anything i'm i'm i can't promise i'll get to it immediately but oh in terms of your question about how i like to be approached i think the best thing to do is send three great songs and a and a one pager you can tell from an idea if uh and and a few songs if something's for you and by the way most of the time it's not that it's bad it's whether it's for me or not um and 
if if something's not for me i will where possible try to still still encourage and support that writer for to get outcomes elsewhere I, because I think, success comes through passion as well doesn't it so you have to be passionate about something to 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 invest in it and take it on that full journey you know i think it, it's important as well isn't it that the writing that you're working with you've got to feel that you can literally take it from from you know embryo to to hatched chickling as it may be although i mean the great thing about having had this concert platform is that there, there can be work that i can help advocate for and promote that i don't have to produce like that i you know there are probably three different strands of work within signal this work that I like adore and I'm just pr proud to curate within concerts I host. And then there's stuff that I feel I can give, but, but, but it's already on its own pathway and it's already maybe commissioned or produced or producers already interested. Then there's stuff in the middle, which I can help a little bit. And then there's stuff that I, you know, I want to direct and produce, you know, or produce myself. And I'm constantly shuffling stuff back and forwards between those. But I think, I think the great thing about concerts and short form, the internet, you know, videos, and is that it gives us the ability to platform more people I, I i've in the past i've put my eggs in one basket i've worked on one show for two years and i think as a director you end up doing that you, you focus all of your time and attention on one thing and that's really why i pivoted to being a producer even though i miss directing painfully i love being in a rehearsal rooms and i love seeing something from beginning to end but frankly if i if in a year if i can help 50 shows a little I'd rather do that than help one show a lot that's just where I am right now because for me it's an operation of scale um for me I'd rather do uh, the system needs to change it's as simple as that the system needs to change uh and I think when musical theatre changes that system will change diversity I think it will change the diversity of voices that we hear the diversity of styles that we hear the diversity of performers that we see the types of genres of music the type of storytelling the say scale for me I'm just I'm just sick of the same 20 shows um, and to actually just refer to another question that we've had about the fact that most West End musicals um relate. yeah I was just about to go on to that so yeah. Mark is it Mark? So I'm a little bit in love. Adam's comment about every alphabet has to be the same way, etc. Trained in MT, but have worked mostly in plays. Uh, and the big difference is I find creatives in plays have far more trust in the actors to make decisions. Big musicals tend to uh, just regurgitate the same show over and over all over the world. This needs to change. I mean, yeah. So, so yeah, there's a chapter about this in my book too, about... So, uh, about the idea of replica musicals being a problem, replica productions. Um, the reason that replica productions exist is because audiences keep buying tickets for them. So, you know, if if an audience, it makes, the, the current decision is that if a show is successful, it kind of gets frozen and transplanted all over the world. The staging is identical, the lighting is identical, every part of it is identical. So if you see Wicked in Japan or London or New York, or Australia, it will be identical except for the language um, as possible. It sort of becomes like a chain like McDonald's where a Big Mac tastes the same everywhere in the world. And um, the reason that that happens is because those shows were once art and then they become businesses. And we should have shows that can become businesses. There should be that part of the economy <laughs> that, where, that things can go into that, but they sh that shouldn't be all there is. So, Mark, I, I, of course, they're going to be need to be shows that are replicas. The, the trouble is that makes up 90 percent of our work uh, it, that, that we're afforded and we're allowed. So rather than continually refueling the tank, we just go, well, we've got this musical from 10 years ago and this from 20 and this from 30 and they can run every night. Again, I'm, you know, I'm blagging the statistics, but a large percentage of the musicals that exist in theatres all over the world were not written in the last 10 years. The skew is off. So essentially, we're just just burning the same fuel again another terrible metaphor and i don't begrudge i mean i do i'd never want to direct or assistant direct or, or be in an uh, you know in a show not to be in a show because i think these are it's amazing opportunities for performers but i i, I wouldn't want to do a replica show because there's no art there um in the making of it there's art in the performance of it um but yeah i just think we need to rebalance it if every year there were 10 new musicals or 20 or 30 being made in regional theatres around the country, in addition to also bringing in the tours, the replica productions, then then it would be fine. But as it is, we're just not getting enough of the other thing. 
And the thing with that is, just to finish up, we'll talk quickly about tomorrow, is that it, it then breeds and creates our industry. So it helps casting directors get more work, directors get more work, lighting designers, costume designers. Do you know what I mean? It, it opens everything out. And so, you know, it's not just the same creatives on everything. It's not the same the same people on everything as well. So it is, it's, it's so important, I think, to, uh, to the culture of musical theatre. Also, when... A few years ago, I, I came up and tweeted this idea called Just One Week. Didn't really take on, take off. But the idea was, you know, as you say, those creatives who made that show once are making weekly royalties for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And it was a real sense of feast and famine. There are people who, you know, you do a show, at, you do a show that runs for four weeks and, and you get £2,000 as a creative. Or you, you direct Les Mis and you get £2,000 a week for 30 years. Um and I, I wanted people to question that. So I started this campaign called Just One Week, which is what if everyone who was making a weekly royalty off a long running musical that had recouped gave one week's royalty to a pot to support new musicals, new creatives, new writers. Didn't take off because my sense is that the people who have achieved those great levels of success believe that they deserved it in a special way and that they sort of don't need to pass it back down, but they do. Because like almost any other industry, the big successes fund the initiatives that, that, that are at a grassroots level. So I always say this, but like, yeah. you know, Spider-Man funds, Spider-Man was funding Lady Bird. The, yeah. the movie Lady Bird was in the same, was same, you know, producing house in the same yeah. year. Apple um, fund startups. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, that's, you know, celebrity biographies at Christmas time fund um, uh, the ability to find those really interesting new writers. You know, Sally Rooney is is made possible because of the fact that those publishers are leveraging their major profits to be able to publish new writers off of big, glossy stuff. But there is no link up between our big, glossy stuff and the the grassroots. So, you know, I just I just wish there were not, you know, and, and what I will say is every show that I am, I've commissioned a musical and it has a kind of clause in it which says that 10% uh, of the writer's royalty is above a certain threshold in perpetuity go back to a writer's fund i don't know if that show will ever ever take off i hope it does but i think the idea of a clause which essentially taxes people who make huge amounts of money um to give back needs to happen in musical theater because we need more systemic help at a grassroots level and um than we're getting and again i think if we had more money at grassroots then then everything would change the diversity of voices and styles and tones would change because people wouldn't have to have a certain level of privilege to access this if there were money at the bottom but there isn't money at the bottom yeah. so like you have to be a multi-portfolio person like me that does about 50 things every week to try and scrabble a living and it's um you know i'm 35 i want to be an adult sometime <laughs> well that's, that's been amazing let's talk Thanks, about James. tomorrow what are you what are you bringing us tomorrow so i thought tomorrow i would do i'd do some more more of a workshop process based about all of the stages of bringing together a musical um and the sort of the ways in which i work so it will be more musicals but with a tint of new musicals along the way so i'll talk through coming up with idea you know, uh, conceiving with a designer, casting, rehearsals, and, and and getting the show out there. And I'll just sort of talk about my reflections at each stage. So probably spend sort of five, five to 10 minutes on my reflections of each stage that goes into making a musical and then answer some questions. But it will be, my sense is it will be most interesting to people who want to be in the rooms making musicals, whether that's actors whether that's directors whether that's mds but but um less producer based probably and more more art based fantastic absolutely brilliant adam what an amazing so much, james really really fabulous Thanks everyone for watching absolutely i'm going to uh take you out of the room but don't go anywhere <laughs> so uh from everyone watching thank you so much adam it's been Thanks, brilliant hour, and we will see you tomorrow see you tomorrow bye james Oh, amazing. Well, I hope you uh, enjoyed that. That was, I certainly did. That was really, really great. It's just so great to have these conversations. Um, as you probably know, we are having lots of these uh, conversations um, because change is necessary, right? Uh, and sometimes it's not. Uh, anyway, okay, who have we got coming up next? We have, uh, my hands, I'm very warm today. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to get my uh, 
uh, pad. We have uh, singing pop music uh, with wonderful Katie Richardson at 1.30, so please uh, come back to us for that. Um, but again, thank you so much to Adam Lenson for his time today, and he will be back tomorrow. Uh, so please, please, please tune in for that. Other than that, um, oh, thank you, Hannah Kent. Uh, other than that, we will see you very, very soon.